Welcome to Anthem Chapel's Sermon of the Week. I'll open your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Uh, if we've never been introduced, my name is Nate, one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you to Anthem Chapel. Hopefully you feel, uh, you know you're in the right place today. This is a church. We're glad to have you. If this is your first time, as has been mentioned before, we are glad that you're spending a Sunday morning with us. Because we definitely believe God's given us a vision as a church to proclaim the name of Jesus. That all would look to him and be saved, that our desire as a faith family is to learn how to love and live like Jesus. So that's what we're doing here. We believe we don't have to be here. We get to be here. Amen. So thank you for joining us. Um, we have kind of uh, been studying the book of Romans since last February. We took a pause for Christmas. We took a pause the past uh, month of January as we spent some time as a church uh, pressing into the presence of Jesus. Our theme for January was all eyes on Jesus. And so many of you participated in our reading of God's word together, going through the book of John. We fasted as a church, saying something, saying no to the flesh, to say yes to the spirit. And of course, we uh, spent some time praying, just listening to what the Lord would uh, say to us. And uh, before we begin uh, back in Romans, I, I just wanted to um, read a few of the uh, prayer responses. You know, uh, two Sundays ago, we asked you to write out some ways. We gave you guys these cards. This was two Sundays ago when we asked you, um, how did God answer the prayers you have been praying during the month of January? And uh, here's just a couple. I'm not going to put names. Well, there was no names, but I uh, just wanted to encourage you to see how God is moving in our church. Uh, some of the answers to prayers were, were this. Uh, one was, the word came alive in brand new ways to me. It was revitalizing to my soul to understand who Jesus is in a fresh new way. That was awesome. Another prayer uh, response or uh, answer to prayer. Um, he brought my daughter home to live with me after three years of being apart. So I don't know who wrote that. that, that that's really sweet. Another person put, I received an unexpected apology. And that was something that was sweet to this person. Another person put, I, I was called to an unexpected deep call to repentance uh, during this time of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Another person wrote, uh, God broke down walls that were between us, the parents, and our, and our kids. Another person wrote, uh, our family unity has been restored. That's awesome. Another person put, he calmed, God calmed the tornado that was ravaging through my life. And uh, it was just, we, I was, as a staff, as a leaders and pastors, we, were just, we got to just read these and just give glory to the Lord of how he showed up. And uh, I read these as an encouragement to you to know that God is alive and well. He is uh, interested in your life. He listens in. In fact, Scripture says he leans in to the prayers of his people. And he's not only a God that hears, he's a God that answers. And so we believe in a, in a, answer, a prayer answering God, you know. And so we wanted you to uh, just be aware of that. And thank you for joining us in the month of January as we fit, fit, fixed all eyes on Jesus. God is on the move in the good land. Amen? Amen. Jeremiah, uh, Lamentations 3 says this, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. So thank you, church, for pressing into Jesus this past month, and I'm excited to be back in the book of Romans. Our heart for uh, the next few weeks is to finish the book of Romans by Easter time, and that way we can focus on Easter, excited. In fact, you know, we're just like six weeks away from Easter. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, you know, Lent leading up to Easter. Easter's right around the corner. We believe that's a big outreach for us as a, as a church service, so we'll be done with the book of Romans by then. Romans 13. Now, as a way just to kind of reintroduce ourselves, it was back in November we finished Romans chapter 12. 
many, many months ago. A lot of you don't even remember November. That was Thanksgiving time, if you think about that. And uh, just as a way of reminder, also I am aware that the Super Bowl is happening at 3.30. So don't worry, I'm going to get you away from this place sooner than later, all right? Don't worry about it. I know you're thinking 49ers. Did you see our drummer wearing a 49ers? There he is right there, 49ers. Uh, wait, who is someone else with 49ers back there? Yeah. Now, I am from, I do have a lot of family uh, in Missouri. I was kind of thinking about the Chiefs, but I've been still, oh, there's my drummer right there, Andrew. There you are, right there, man. And, uh, but the Brock Purdy story, that's pretty cool. The guy's a believer. I'm, I don't know what's going to happen, so it's going to be fun. But, but until that moment, let's get in God's word. Paul spent the first 11 chapters of Romans describing to us what we would call doctrine, uh, truths about God. And we spent almost all of last year thinking about who God is and what he's done. The truth about God, the truth about ourselves, that we uh, are sinners in need of a savior, the problem of sin, the provision of salvation, the process of sanctification, becoming more and more like Christ, the sovereignty of God and his plan. And then chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, Paul switches up and goes from doctrine to duty. So, so now that we've spent some time thinking about who God is and what he's done for us, how are we now to live out our lives? And Romans chapter 12 has that beautiful beginning. We're not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How are we going to live out this inward transformation? That's our duty. And so chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 really describe to us as Christians how do we live as believers? How do we express our faith to those around us? The type of life that was characterized by those first century Christians, when people talked about those Christians, they said, these are the people that are turning the world upside down. That, that kind of life, that's what Paul's talking about here. And that's our challenge for us this morning, is how do we pursue the good for the good land? How do we live in such a way that people see Jesus in us? That the way that we live our life influences the community around us. As we're living out loud, as we're loving out loud, we're bringing hope to a hurting world, amen? And we believe that Jesus fills the void of, of life for every human being. That your neighbor that, that is exhausted, your, your co-worker that is, is gripped by anxiety, your, your friend who, who's battling depression, your brother who is searching for the meaning of life, your sister who struggles with her self-worth, we believe Jesus fills the void, amen? That Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is our anthem. And Jesus wants to use you to reach the world. And so Romans chapter 13, Paul is going to press into two areas of life. And I thought I could do the whole chapter today, but there's no way I can do it. So I only do the first seven verses. And it's all about your favorite topic, which is the government and, uh, and, and politics. And you're just like, this is great. Uh, chapter 13 is really broken into two, two main uh, sections. The first seven verses are kind of about politics and the government. The last seven verses are about people, how we are to love people. And so we're going to just kind of press into this first idea. Romans 13, verse 1 says this. Now let every person be subject to the governing authorities. You're already thinking it's a great day to be here. <laughs> For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. This is a foundational verse. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resist what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what's good, and you will receive his approval. Verse 4, for he is God's servant. Think about that. God's servant Diakonos, deacon, God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. 
Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, here it gets better, guys, you pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. So pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. And we'll just add in verse 8 for today. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. This is our text for us this morning. Would you spend a moment just praying for our time with me? Father, we uh, come before you just still thinking about the song we just sang. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. How you love us. God the Father sending God the Son into the world to save me from my sin. Wow. It's just remarkable. We, We could sing that song forever. How he loves us. So Lord, as we understand and begin to see greater facets of your love for us, we in turn want to respond by loving you and living a life that's worthy of your calling upon us. And so as we think about this text, your word before us, we believe you have us in this moment for such a time as this. So here we are, your people, your children, listening to your word, not my voice, but your voice in this place today. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Two two thoughts for us today, the authority of government and our attitude toward government. The authority of government and our attitude toward government. Look at verse one. So Paul says this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, For there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. I'm reading out of the ESV version, in case you want to know. Now, uh, look at the text here. Look at the text. Look at the the idea it says here. The first thing it says, let every person. Uh, The word there for person, maybe your Bible version says the word soul. In the Greek, it's the word psyche. It means soul, like living person, anyone that's alive. ESV also has the word be subject. Maybe your Bible version says submitted to. Uh, the word there in the Greek is this really cool word. It means it's a hupo tasso. Hupo means under. Uh, tasso has the idea of something being arranged in order, uh, like a being lined up. And so what Paul's telling us is that every single person, every soul is to be submitted, to be lined up under governing authorities. Now, just me saying that, uh, just you reading this, I can already see temperatures rising, uh, bloods beginning to boil a little bit. Why? Well, because rebellion is in our DNA. None of us like people telling us what to do. None of us like to really be under authority. It began in the garden with Adam and Eve. Rebellion is in our DNA. You did it on your way to church today. The speed limit said 65. You think that is an optional idea for you. Maybe as parents, you've told your kids that the stop signs with the white borders are optional. They all have white borders, by the way. They're on, you know. Um, maybe you're here and, uh, you know, you got, I got one other day, a UCSB parking ticket and it came in the mail and it just, the seeing the little parking services, I'm just like, ah, what happened there? Why can't I just park to check the surf at campus? Maybe you remember the best days of your life in school where when you walked in the class and what was by the chalkboard, a substitute teacher. Why? Because they have no authority. You, they can't tell you what to do. Well, maybe in some levels they can. It's up to teachers out there. We love you guys. But still, you know, <laughs> you know, it was the best day. They're not your real teacher. So what's Paul? What, what's going on here? Paul, what are you asking us to do in response to what God has done for us? Submit to governing authorities. We are to be the best citizens in the community in which we live. 
And this is what's called a categorical imperative. Uh, meaning this is a command for all people regardless of your desire to obey or not. It's a categorical imperative. Now in just a moment, we're going to talk about when it is our duty to disobey. Uh, but right now, Paul's laying down the foundation for citizens in a community to line up under the governing authority. Remember that Paul is not writing this letter to the United States of America. What's the title of the book we've been studying? Romans. Romans. He's writing to Christians living in Rome. I don't know if you've ever watched a documentary. Do you know anything about Roman rule? It wasn't the best. Let's just say uh, Israel, the, 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 the nation, was under the occupying force of Rome. At the writing of this letter, most likely, most uh, theologians would say the Caesar at the moment, the king of Rome, the king in charge, was a guy named Caesar Nero. And if you want to just look him up, Wikipedia Nero, and you'll recognize what a bad dude this guy was. A no fan of Christians. A little bit senile even. He was wildly wicked. And Paul is writing to citizens, Christians, in a time of Roman occupation under Caesar Nero, and he's saying, hey, our response is to submit to line up under the governing authorities. Every soul, any one, any place, any time. And you might say already, again, your blood is boiling. You might be saying, well, well I, I, I had this experience and I had this kind of encounter, and, 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 and this has happened to me. And Paul would say, Democrat or dictator, Republican or revolutionary, communist or king, Paul, in verse 1, makes a categorical imperative that all persons be subject to the governing authorities. Now, why? That's the question we've got to ask ourselves. Why would Paul ask us to do this? It goes to sense every, everything inside of us. We're just itching to, to, re, to rebel against this. Why? Verse 1 continues. Look what he says. This is an, we've got to sit on this for a minute. Look at the second sentence of verse 1. Look what he says. For there, this is mind-blowing, for there is no authority except from God. There is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. I mean, just think about that, what he's saying. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist, those that exist in the entire nation, history of the world, have been instituted. That means appointed by God. No authority except from God. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that Paul is saying real authority does not exist without God? Right? What's, what's authority? What's real authority? It's the moral right to tell someone what to do. Real authority, right? It's the, it's the moral right to tell someone what to do. So someone steals my car. And I need a, an authority higher than myself to tell that person that's the wrong thing to do when they catch that person. It's the moral right to tell someone what to do. And there is no morality apart from God. Without God, there's no standard of behavior. So even in a secular government, what Paul's letting us know is they're actually being held accountable to God. Those that exist have been instituted, appointed by God. Now, for those of you that are Bible students, you can run through a few leaders through governing authorities in your mind. We think about Pharaoh in Egypt. He was in charge. He did some bad stuff to Israel, but he was instituted by God. We think about, you know, Esther and Darius, this, the Persian king, and did some bad stuff, but he was appointed, instituted by God. We think about Nebuchadnezzar. Some of you ladies have been studying the book of Daniel. 
Think about Nebuchadnezzar. He was a gnarly dude, but he was instituted by God. We think about Herod and Pilate, who Jesus would stand before. Gnarly governors instituted by God. All authority comes from God. You know, God instituted three, three institutions, you could say. The family, the first institution, Adam and Eve. He created husband, wife, family. He created the church. He tells us, I want you to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He instituted church as an institution, if you will. And he instituted the government you think about after the flood, he speaks to Noah and he says, Noah, for your lifeblood, there will be a reckoning. He says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall, be, shall uh, his blood be shed, instituting the government. Remember when Jesus stands before Pilate and they're having this interaction and Pilate, you know, and Jesus is not, not uttering a word. He's just standing there. And Pilate says, you know, you're silent to me. Don't you know I have the power? I have the authority to either release you or to crucify you. And do you recall the response of Jesus? He says, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. And we read in Scripture that after this interaction, Pilate keeps his mouth shut. In fact, we read that he actually tries to release Jesus from that time on. He recognizes, oh, this guy's right. Authority. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel talks about it's God who sets up kings and tears down kings. And God has established authority and it's his will to govern the world through human civil authority. And notice verse 4, what he says. He says, for he, he meaning just the idea of authority, is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is a servant of God, an avenger who, come, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Now look at the text there, the word servant, servant. It's the Greek word diakonos, where you get the word deacon. So what Paul's saying is that authority, those that are in authority, they're actually God's servants. And so the mayor is God's servant. The police officers, those are God's servants. Firemen, congresswomen, God's servant. Civil servants, servants of God. And sometimes that authority is a blessing on a, on a nation. And sometimes it's not. And this does not justify governing authorities that are evil, of course. Governments that allow injustice and trample the weak and refuse to defend the innocent. We're all aware. We've all had history class. We're aware of the horrific events in which authorities have abused power. What we've got to recognize is they're failing their God-given role. And regardless, we're called as citizens living in a community to submit, to line up under. Now, I told you there was a little asterisk there. You've been waiting for it, but when can I disobey? <laughs> We've got to first understand we're called to obey. We're called to obey. But, but there is a time. There is a time to disobey. There is a time when our duty is to disobey the government. When, when being a good citizen means I'm going to be a bad Christian. Does that make sense? When being a good citizen results in me being a bad Christian. If the state commands what God forbids, or the state forbids what God commands, then disobedience is our duty. A few examples, again, from Scripture. We think about Remember when um, Israel is in Egypt and Pharaoh says to the Hebrew midwives, whenever an Israelite woman is giving birth to a baby boy, kill that baby. And what do we read the Hebrew wives did? They disobeyed that order. They said, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. We think about, um, I mean, classic, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
they were commanded to bow down before this idol. And they said, if being a good citizen means I'm a bad follower of God, I'm not going to do it. And they don't bow down. And what is their reward? Thrown into the fiery furnace. Again, their friend Daniel. Daniel is commanded, hey, at this time, you're not supposed to pray to anybody except uh, our, our God, our idol. And Daniel's like, forget that. And Daniel begins to pray, and he gets arrested, thrown into the lion's den. Peter and John in Acts, they're preaching the name of Jesus. And their rulers say, hey, Peter and John, you know, what I want you to do is stop saying the name of Jesus around here. And they look back at the guys and say, hey, I, I don't know about you, but is it, is it better to obey God or obey men? We're going to obey God. And so there is a time, of course, to disobey. But Jesus, in one sentence, would establish the validity of government and yet also limit its reach. You remember when they were trying to trap Jesus a little bit and they say to him, hey, is it okay for us to pay taxes or not? And Jesus is a masterful response. He says, well, give me a coin. And they hand him a coin. And he says, well, who, whose image is on this coin? And they say, well, it's Caesar. He says, okay, well, then here's what you got to do. You need to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And you need to give to God what is God's. He's saying, I'm establishing governing authority. I give to Caesar what is due him. The imprint of Caesar's on this coin, then you need to pay and you need to render to him. But whose image is imprinted on you? You're made in the image of God, so you need to give your whole life to him. Give to Caesar what's Caesar. Give to God's what's God's. So we are in circumstances Duty is to disobey. You know, we can do some examples. You can probably think about our time with COVID. We don't know how to get too nitty gritty there, but I'll just tell you my own personal testimony there. You know, we were the mask mandates and the and the uh, and the thing with the shot. What's that called? The vaccine. You know. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know. People had their personal convictions on that. For for me. For me, I was never told to not preach Jesus. Uh, we weren't allowed to meet, but the moment we kind of were allowed to meet in the open space, we met in the open space. And I was never once asked, don't preach about sin and don't preach Jesus. So for me, it, being a good citizen didn't make me a bad Christian. Like, like I was able to, to navigate that. It was hard. I wouldn't say it was easy, but for me, I was like, hey, we're going to meet in open spaces. We've got this tent. We've got this field. Hey, you know what? You, you wanna, we're going to make some spaces here. We'll, we'll, we'll create some. Remember those? Uh, we spray painted those uh, orange squares everywhere. I mean, to me, it was like, you know what? It's, it's not that big of a deal. This is me, my personal testimony. It's not that big of a deal to create a space that's safe for people to come and be welcome into, and we can preach Jesus and have our eyes focused on him. That's what we're all, Jesus is our anthem. That's what we're lifting up. It, it, it wasn't too hard to navigate for me. Will it get harder? It could get harder. It could get harder for us. And we'll have to walk that line. But Paul is not talking about the exceptions. He's talking about the majority. We are to be good citizens in the community that we live. If we want to pursue the good for the good land, then we've got to be people that, that honor and respect now, what's the purpose of government, you would say? Like, why would we submit? Like, like, why? Why would he say this? Look what it says in verse, let's look at verse three. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. Right, we understand this. When you're speeding down the freeway and you see a police officer, you're not doing good, so you're worried. Put the brakes on. That's what he's talking about, verse 3. So what's the purpose of government? Two, two ideas. This is an ex exhaustive list. But number one is to punish evil, to punish evil. Look at verse 4. For he is God's servant for your good. If you do wrong, be afraid. He does not bear the sword in vain. He is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrong wrongdoer. So the responsibility of the government, why we're called to submit and to respect and to honor, it's because the government, the ruling authority, number one's job is to punish evil. You see that in verse four, it says the sword. 
He does not bear the sword in vain. And there's a couple of ways to think about that. The picture, an image of a sword in all of Scripture always has a, is a symbol of violence, right? It's a symbol of authority. Anybody know where the first time we read of a sword in Scripture is? In Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve have just disobeyed God. And they're sent out of the Garden of Eden. And what do we read God does? He sets some cherubim, some angels at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. And their presence alone wasn't enough. He gives them a sword that's on fire. He gives them a sword. And the idea there is like, hey, this is to govern what I've told them. They're not allowed to come back in here. And so if the angel's presence wasn't gnarly enough, they have a sword as well. It was an image of authority, image of like, hey, if you come this way, there will be punishment. There will be a recompense. There will, there will be a reckoning. Now, so we think about this in the relation to government. The sword is this image that describes the power to inflict a penalty for evil. Now, this penalty, what is it up to? I, I would say it is up to death. That's the idea here. The government has the sword to inflict a penalty for wrongdoing up to death. This doesn't answer all the questions of capital punishment. doesn't answer all the questions of what crimes and what's the burden of proof. And uh, does it not take into account all the complexities of that? But it does show, I believe, very pretty clearly, the government has this responsibility to punish wrongdoing. Secondly, though, not just to punish evil, but to promote good. Did you see that in verse 4? It says, for he, the government, the authority is God's servant for your good, for your good, for your good. Because of this, for your good, our, our welfare. So the government, the authority, those that are in charge of our, of our city, of our state, it's, they're to promote the good. And so last weekend, we had a power outage over by my house, by Dos Pueblos. And the part of the city of the Galita, I was like, okay, they're going to get it back in action. They're going to work toward my good. They don't want my house to be in dark forever. My neighbor was showing off his Tesla battery. He had all the lights on during that time. That's fine. That's fine. We were in pitch blackness. It's all right. Go you solar power people. But I knew that the city was going to, it's for my good. I think about the floods that happened. There was a trees that fell down and, and cow trans. They're working to make sure the roads are clear. They're for our good. Punish evil, promote good. So what should be our attitude toward government? Well, we already thought about this idea of submitting, lining up under, but Paul pushes it a little bit for us, verse 6. So because of this, because of what we're talking about, because authorities instituted by God, because they're here to punish evil and promote good because of this, you're to pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God. The word there for minister is even more intense than the word servant. Minister there talks about that word's only used for those that would serve in the temple of God. So it's like, these, I mean, this is like really mind-blowing they're ministers of God. They're doing God's holy work. That's insane. Attending to this very thing. So pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Like this is not that hard to understand. Christians are to be the best citizens in the community that we live so what are some, some takeaways of our attitude thinking about this? I want you to think of three letters, and they're the letter CPR. Because this whole time, we've probably been having a little bit of a heart attack. <laughs> so, so here we go, CPR. Uh, number one, we need to be calm. <laughs> we need to be calm. You don't need to be fearful or anxious over who was governing. We don't need to lose our minds. We need to see past the present moment 
and peer into the providence of God. We need to see past the present moment and peer into the providence of God. Providence of God is this idea of God's caring provision for his people to accomplish his purpose. God's provision for his people to accomplish his purpose. Don't fail to see God who's on the throne. See past the present moment. Peer into the providence of God. We need to be calm. Don't don't freak out when your person is not in charge. Because guess what? Our person, Jesus, is in charge. King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, should we engage in the political process? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus, his instructions to us, when he left, he said, I want you to occupy until I come. I want you to occupy. Like, go about your business. Like, do life. Work it out. Occupy. So we're going to engage. Should we speak truth to the powers that be? Absolutely. John the Baptist, one example, he speaks truth to Herod. You married your brother's wife. That's not okay. We're going to speak truth. We're going to speak truth to the powers. We're going to engage. We're going to occupy. We're going to speak. We're going to speak up for the voiceless and stand up for the innocent. We're going to strengthen the weak and the overlooked and the marginalized and the outcast. But should we freak out? (laughs) No. We don't need to freak out. We're going to see past the present moment. We're going to appear into the providence of God. God, you've instituted this. You're in control. What's my part to play? But Lord, you are king of kings. Understand the sovereignty of God, his overarching control of this world, and that he can use whoever he wants to accomplish his purpose. If he can use a donkey, he can use anybody else, right? Period. That's all I'm going to say about that. See, stay calm, stay calm, stay calm, stay calm, church. P, we need to pray. We do need to pray. Paul would say in 1 Timothy, he would say this, First of all, then I urge that supplications and prayers and intercessors and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and for all who are in high positions. So we need to be a praying church. I challenge you, we need to pray greater than we criticize. How about that? We need to pray. We need to pray. C, calm. P, pray. R, respect. We need to show respect. We need to respect authority even if they represent our views or they don't represent our views. Peter would say this, 1 Peter 2.13, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it to be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. First Peter 2, 13. I think an example for us in the history of Israel as we come to a close is Israel was taken captive by Babylon. They were living under Nebuchadnezzar rule in Babylon. And they weren't sure how to live. We're Jews in Babylon. We've been taken from Jerusalem. We're now living in this foreign land, foreign cultures, foreign people, foreign language. What should we do here? And God sent Jeremiah, the prophet, to the people. And Jeremiah writes this letter. And it's read in the presence of Israel living in Babylon as captives, as exiles. And this is what the letter says. Jeremiah 29, verse 4. The letter says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. That's what he says. Build houses. Live in them. Plant gardens. Eat their produce. Take wives. Have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear you sons and daughters. Multiply there. 
Do not decrease. And then he says this, verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. I mean, what an instructive text for us. Christians living in an ungodly community. How are we to go about? Should we, should we hibernate? Should we isolate? No, 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 no. Build houses. Live your life. Get married. Be salt. Be light. Be ambassadors. You're adopted. You're accepted. Go out and seek the welfare of the city, he says. I've sent you here as exile. Pray to the Lord for the city. For its welfare, well, you will find your welfare. Stay calm. I'm in charge. Begin to pray. Pray for your city. Pray for your community. Respect, submit, trust in me. Because when you honor authority, it's as though you're honoring the Lord. Because honoring them is honoring him. And the Lord honors those who honor him. As we come to a close, how, how do we close up this moment? Well, we have to have our eyes on Jesus. How did, how did Jesus live this out? What was his example for us to follow? I mean, just think what began in eternity is Jesus made a decision to descend. He made a decision to submit to his heavenly father's desire to leave heaven and to come to earth. Jesus submitted himself to become in the form of a human, in the form of a baby. Jesus submitted himself to this idea of, of growing and maturing and learning to walk and learning to talk. I mean, Jesus' earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, they submitted to the government. Where were, why were they in Bethlehem? Because they submitted to the census being taken place. And Jesus shows us what it was like to submit. Everything that he spoke, everything that he did, every, every healing, every miracle, it was in surrender and submission to his heavenly Father. Choosing the disciples, everything. This image of him in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying the cross before him. And what is his beautiful prayer? Not my will. Like, I don't really want to do this. But it's not, it's not me. I'm going to surrender. I'm submitting to you, King, my Father. Not my will, but your will be done. And because of his submission, we receive salvation. And so we're to be the best citizens in the community. We're to be the best HOA members they've ever heard. We're, we're to be the best PTA supporters that the school has ever experienced. We're to pay our taxes like we're paying a minister of God. We're to surrender. We're just to submit. And when we live like this, when we live like this, it's going to influence our city. And it's going to bring good to the community. As Jeremiah says, its welfare is your welfare. So as we come to a close, we have an opportunity for communion today. And I'm going to call the worship team is here and we're going to transition into a time. You know, maybe when you think about authority, you just think about hurt. You were maybe hurt by authority. Someone that had rule in your life hurt you, betrayed trust. You had submitted to them and they turned around and used that against you. Maybe your place today is to seek forgiveness and to seek restoration. Because if you can't surrender to authorities around you, how are you ever going to surrender to the Lord? Maybe you're a parent here today and you're having a hard time raising your children and having them obey you. I just challenge you. It starts in the home, thinking about authority setting their hearts right, that we are all under authority. Jesus is not just our Savior, He's our King. 
we submit to him. He's authority over us. He has the right to tell us how to live our life. And so if you're holding the communion elements in your hand, if, if you don't, we'll have the ushers come forward. And, and in this moment, I'll have the a prayer team just maybe sing a stanza. I want to think about a few things. Think about maybe what you need to repent of. Think about maybe some authority that you need to forgive. Let's just enter into a space here for just a moment. Hold the elements, and I'll come back in just a minute, and we'll take these elements together. Thank you for tuning in to Anthem Chapel. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and podcast for more content like this.